Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Am I right? No. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 4 is what I wrote my 40-page paper on last month, and I still got Luke chapter 4 in my brain. Uh, today we're looking at Luke chapter 11, so I've spent a lot of time in the book of Luke lately, but it's been good, really good, Luke chapter 11. In the next few weeks, we want to talk to our church about the Holy Spirit. And so today, I want to give you just a little bit of a, of a taste of what we want to be headed into in the next couple of weeks. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, and so we're going to celebrate by focusing on the Holy Spirit. We focus on the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit always points us to Jesus. Am I right? And when we experience more of the Holy Spirit and we experience the Holy Spirit in our lives, we will experience more of Jesus. We believe that God is one, but he is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And what we want to do next week, what Pastor Amy is going to be doing with you next week, is talking to you about the person of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the person of God the Father. We believe in the person of Jesus Christ, but we also believe in the person of the Holy Spirit. And the lesson, the teaching that you're going to get next Sunday is going to be absolutely wonderful. I've already seen the sermon notes for next Sunday. They are great. And you're going to be blessed next Sunday. So come ready to learn about the Holy Spirit. Some of you are going to learn some things about the Holy Spirit you've never heard before in your life. And it's not because because it's not in the word or it's not and it's not because we created some new doctrine it's because many churches all over the world take no time to put any emphasis on the holy spirit i grew up in a church i knew all i knew about the holy spirit was at the creed into the creed it said and we believe in the holy spirit well what does that mean I had no idea what that meant, and it was very confusing. Some of you grew up maybe going to a church where uh, you heard about the Holy Ghost, and uh, you were confused by the term ghost. Why does God have a ghost? I mean, if God didn't die, and if Jesus is alive, how does he? And so there's a little bit of confusion there. And so Pastor Amy's going to take some time next week and talk to you about the person of the Holy Spirit. The week after that, we want to talk to you about the work of the Holy Spirit. We're not only going to focus on the person of the Holy Spirit, but then also on on the work of the Holy Spirit. What I want to do today is talk to you just simply about being hungry for more of God. Can we be hungry for more of God? Can I have a greater desire for more of God in my life? It's good to learn about the Holy Spirit. The purpose of learning about the Holy Spirit is to relate to the Holy Spirit, to follow the direction of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and to honor the Holy Spirit in a scripture way and allow the Holy Spirit to always point us to Jesus. It's good to not only learn about the Holy Spirit, but it's also good to experience the Holy Spirit. And so one of the things I want to challenge you to think about, I want you to think about church like this. You learn something from the Lord in the preaching time, but then you experience something with the Lord in the response time to the preaching. At the end of preaching, we pray. At the end of the message, we pray together. We seek God together. We experience God together. And so I just want to give you just a little bit of maybe spiritual training as a child of God at Livestream Church that we want to have the lecture of the truth of God, but then we want to have the lab where we experience the truth of God. That's another way to look at that. I believe that when we respond at what we call the altar call, we're coming to the altar place, the altar is the place where people meet with God. And when you come forward at the end of the service to pray and experience the Lord, to let the message that you've heard sink in and become a part of who you are, when you engage in that part of the service, you're going to a place, you're leaving where you're sitting and you're moving to a place where you're going to meet with God. And that's why we call it the altar. It's a metaphorical altar. We don't kill animals. And put them on the altar like they did in the Old Testament. That was the Old Testament altar. We're not talking about an altar where we build a fire and burn a sacrifice. We're talking about the altar is the place where people go to meet with God. Abraham built an altar. What did he do at the altar? He met with God. Isaac built an altar. Jacob built an altar. And he met with God at the altar. God told the children of Israel to build the tabernacle. And when they built the tabernacle, the center of the tabernacle was an altar. Right before they got to the holy place and the most holy place, there was this place. They would meet with God for cleansing before they'd come into his presence. And so we meet with God at the altar. Is everybody with me today? Yes. 
And at the end of the service today, we're going to take time to pray. We're going to take time to seek the Lord. My goal at the end of this service is that, number one, you will leave this place more hungry for the Lord's presence in your life than you came in. I want you to be more hungry for the Lord's presence in your life when you leave this service than when you came into this service. And some of you already came into this service expecting God to work in your life today. Amen? Some of you already came to church hungry. I want you to leave more hungry. You know, a lot of times people are like, Pastor, I came to church and I didn't feel fed. Well, it's nice to be fed at church. The most important thing I want when I walk out of church is I'm still hungry. I don't want to walk out of church fat and fed. I want to walk out of church still hungry. That's being transformed. That's me becoming a different person. So today I want to talk to you about being hungry for the Lord. And the title of the message is Hungry But Hindered. The second thing I want to accomplish is not only for you to be hungry for the Lord when you leave church today and ready to receive more next Sunday and the next Sunday, amen, but I want to eliminate some things that might hinder you from being full of the Lord and experiencing more of him, not only in church services, but anywhere and everywhere you go in your daily devotional times and the times that you pray and you seek the Lord just by yourself. I want you to not be hindered. I don't want there to be any hindrance in your way to receiving from the Lord. How many of you would say, I'd like that today? I'd like to remove hindrances from receiving from the Lord. So we're going to start with Luke chapter 9. Verses 9 through 13. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And listen to what he says. Some of you, this is so familiar. He said, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. How many of you heard that before? I've heard that before. And how many of you maybe have gone to the Lord in prayer about a financial need, a physical need, a family need? You've sought the Lord because you wanted to know that you were saved. You wanted an assurance of your salvation. Maybe you sought the Lord. You knocked, you sought, and you found because you read the scripture and you knew, I need to ask. I need to ask the Lord for the things I need. Listen to what happens next. When you see the context, verse 11, the very next thing Jesus says is, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? It's almost sarcastic, isn't it? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion That's also sarcastic, isn't it? I had an egg for breakfast. Am I glad I didn't have a scorpion for breakfast? I'm very glad. Then listen to what Jesus says. If you, you fathers, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Everybody say ask. Those who ask him. I think that Jesus is inviting us today to ask for more of the Holy Spirit. We should ask. This morning I want to encourage those of you who are hungry for more of the Holy Spirit to ask for more of the Holy Spirit. I want to spur some of you on to becoming hungry for more of the Holy Spirit Some of you have come to church and you've given your heart to Jesus Christ and you're saved and you know that you're on your way to heaven and you're grateful. Maybe you come to church because you're grateful for your salvation. But I want to challenge you to come to church also because you have become hungry for more of God. There is this great big God who created the universe and all that is in in it. The earth earth is the Lord's and everything that is in in it is in it. In it is his. I didn't quote that scripture very well, but I'm telling you, we serve a great big God, and there's more of him to know. There's more of him to experience. There's more of him to be like in character. There is more of the Lord for us to receive. And I want to challenge you to be a person who is hungry for more and is willing to ask. Willing to ask. Many people are hungry. They desire more of God. They want to be closer to God. They want his power in their life. They want his power in their life to overcome temptations, to overcome troubles. 
They really desire more of the Holy Spirit, more of God's power in their life, but they feel hindered and they wonder why they're not getting to the next level and they're not receiving the next thing that the Lord may have for them. I've been there. I've had that question many times in my life. And I can tell you right now, getting ready for this sermon series, getting ready for the next few weeks, I have become more hungry for the Lord. And I wonder, Lord, what are you going to do in me? What are you going to do with my life? Because I don't know, but I know that he's good and I want more. I know that he's good and I know that I want more. I want to give you some thoughts today that I think will help you overcome some hindrances that might keep you from receiving more of the Lord. Is everybody ready? And I believe that by giving these to you at the beginning, it's going to prepare you for the things that you're going to receive from the Lord in the next few weeks. Number one. If you don't want to be hindered, become a person who will ask. Ask for more of the Holy Spirit. Ask for more. Jesus said, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more? How much more than your, he- your earthly father would give you good things? How many of you remember when your dad gave you a good Christmas gift when you were a kid? Anybody remember that? You, anybody get a good, a good Christmas gift? Your heavenly father wants to give you good gifts more than your father wanted to give you good Christmas gifts. Your heavenly father wants to give you more good gifts than your father who maybe gave you a car when you were a teenager. Your heavenly father wants to give you good gifts more than your earthly father may have paid for part of your college when you were a young adult. Your heavenly father wants to give you good gifts more than your earthly father who gave you a beautiful, expensive, elaborate wedding. I mean, think of all the things that fathers may give their children. Your heavenly father wants to give the Holy Spirit even more. That's good, isn't it? Your heavenly father loves you and he has good gifts for you. When Jesus said, ask and it'll be given to you, seek and you'll find, knock and the door shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, those who seek find and those who knock the door will be opened. He was talking about receiving more of the Holy Spirit. In Luke, when he's, now I believe Jesus said that over and over. He said it in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter four, uh, five, six, and seven. But I believe there are some things Jesus preached over and over and over and over and over again. There are some things he preached on a hilltop, and then we see later he preaches those same things in Luke on a plane. And you're like, well, did he preach it on a mountain, or did he preach it on a hilltop? The answer is he preached it everywhere. He preached repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Everywhere he went. Jesus said it when, when he said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news. He said, now I must go to other towns and take this message there. Jesus preached the same thing over and over again. And one of the things that I think he said several times is ask, seek, and knock. And in Luke, he said it in relationship to receiving more of the Holy Spirit. We need to be people who ask Ask for more of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we, we are hindered because we assume if God wants to do it, he'll do it. I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to see what happens. I'm just going to live my life. And if God wants to break in and do something amazing or do something spectacular, God will break in and God will do it. But I'm telling you that Jesus said we're supposed to ask. I'm not just supposed to wait He'll do whatever he wants to do. If he wants me to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it'll happen sometime. If he wants me to be used in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it'll happen sometimes. If if he wants to show me something new in his word, well, then someday I'll be motivated to read the Bible and he'll show me something in his word. No, 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 no. Let's ask let's knock, let's go after God, let's pray, let's wait, let's tarry, let's seek the Lord, and then we'll receive. It's not a passive thing. It's a, we've been told to ask. Is everybody with me today? Yes. It's not passive. We've been told to ask. And some people are hindered from receiving more because they just don't ask. I remember a long time in my life. I didn't ask. I didn't know I was supposed to ask. I didn't know there was more that I should be asking of from the Lord. And so my walk with the Lord was tepid. My walk with the Lord was lukewarm. I questioned my salvation. I wasn't sure I was going to go to heaven. But listen, when I started to ask for more of the Lord's Holy Spirit, some things began to happen in my life, and God began to transform me. And I wasn't just a person who said, I believe in Jesus, when really I wasn't sure. I became a person who was sure, who was saved, and was growing in the Lord and receiving more of the Holy Spirit. It's a life-transforming thing that happens when you begin to ask. So number one, if you want to get rid of that hindrance, start asking. 
ask the Lord for more. There are some things you may ask the Lord for for a long time, but don't stop asking. Amen? Don't stop asking. Here's a second little thought that I think will help you to not be hindered to receive more, and that is live holy. Live a holy life. David said in Psalm 66, verse 18, if I had cherished sin in my heart, then the Lord would not have heard my cry. If I cherished sin. Now, we all make mistakes and we all err. None of us are perfect. However, we don't have to be the kind of people who hold on to sin and cherish it and take care of it and guard it or hide it. We need to be people who put it away. We run away from it. We repent of it. We turn from sin and we allow God to transform us. As you ask for more of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that God will do is he will make you more holy. He will make you more pure in your words, in your speech, in your thoughts, in your living. He'll make your desires more pure. If you'll seek God for more of the Holy Spirit, he will do a sanctifying work in you. He will do a cleansing, transforming work in you. And it's not just I'm seeking the Holy Spirit because I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues and be used in the gifts of the Spirit and all these other kinds of miraculous things. The most miraculous thing that the Holy Spirit's going to do in you first is make you holy. Is everybody with me today? And when he begins to work like that in my life, I'm going to say yes to that. And when I say yes to that, he's going to take me to this next level. And I'm going to go from this glory of the Lord that I've experienced to the next glory of the Lord. And Paul says in Corinthians that we go from glory to glory to glory. We can be moving our relationship with the Lord. We can be growing in our relationship with the Lord. And part of that, an essential part of that, Probably the most important part of that is that he changes who I am. And I get to share in the life of Jesus, the life of God, the resurrection power of Jesus. And the resurrection power of Jesus makes me into a new person. And I'm a new person when my character is changed. Amen? So I want to challenge you. Be a person that lives a holy life. He's called us to be holy. It's not legalistic or judgmental to say, I'm going to be holy. It's just being more like Jesus. It's just allowing the nature of God to become my nature. I'm never going to be God. I'm never going to be the son of God, but I'm going to be more like my heavenly father, and I'm going to be more like his son, my savior and Lord Jesus Christ, when I ask for more of the Holy Spirit. And as I receive the Holy Spirit, as I experience the Holy Spirit, he is going to do a sanctifying work. John the Baptist said that when Jesus comes, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And all through the scripture, the picture of fire is a purifying work. And so the Holy Spirit is going to do a purifying work in you. Maybe you're hungry for the Lord today, number one, because you long for that purifying work in you. You're tired of being that person that quotes Romans chapter 7 over and over again. What I do... I don't want to do. And what I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Paul said that that's the wrestling match that we have on the inside of ourselves until the law of the spirit of life sets us free from the law of sin and death, Romans chapter 8. That's a good word, isn't it? It's the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Live a holy life. You, you strive for it and let the Holy Spirit work it out. Here's the third thing. Some people are hindered from receiving more of the Lord because they have not taken time to learn about the Holy Spirit. And so I challenge you in the next few weeks, take time to learn about the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19, verse two, Paul goes to the city of Ephesus and he meets some people who call themselves disciples. And he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Their response is, We've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. What are you talking about, Apostle Paul? These individuals needed to learn about the Holy Spirit, didn't they? And I want to challenge you to be a person that learns about the Holy Spirit. I remember for years, I went to a religious school, and I uh, went to church on the weekends and had to memorize creeds and things from the catechisms how many of you did that and it was really fun when you were a kid? Anybody with me? Like one, two, there's a few of us, yeah. And I learned some good things in those things that I memorized, and I learned some good things in those creeds. It formalized in my mind and in my thinking that there's a God in heaven, 
There's a heaven to gain, there's a hell to shun, and there's a Savior who really did die on the cross for my sins. I believed all of that. And there's a point in my life where I believed all of those things, and yet I knew I was not going to heaven. And I needed God to work in me. In those, time, in those times and in those days in my life, I didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. All I knew was at the end of the creed, it said, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. That was it. It was the extent of my knowledge. But as I, as I got around people who wanted to teach me the scriptures and they wanted to teach me the word of God, then I began to learn that there was a whole lot more to the Holy Spirit and his work than what I had assumed there's a whole lot more to the third person of the Trinity, the third person of the Godhead, than I had ever known before. And I needed to learn, and I began to learn. And I was so hungry. I was eager to learn. I wanted to read my Bible. I was a teenager that wanted to go to the extra church services because I wanted to learn about the Holy Spirit. I was the teenager that was hungry for more of God and would sit with older people and listen to them tell me about the Holy Spirit, tell me about their experiences with the Holy Spirit because I was hungry for more of God. And no one had ever taught me about that as a little kid. I was hungry for more. So I was ready to learn. And I'm telling you that even after I began to have experiences with the Lord, there were things that I didn't even know that I didn't understand. Did that sentence make sense to everybody? I'll give you one example. On a Sunday evening, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the, on Monday morning, I went to school the next day. And some friends of mine that I would talk to every day came up to me and said, what'd you do this weekend? And I looked at those friends and I said, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Here's what happens when you choose Jesus as your Savior. And I just began to explain the whole thing to them. I had never ever shared my faith with someone in my life. Never. Absolutely not. I, there's no way at that point in my life as a young person that I would verbalize my faith and share it with a group of people who just said, what'd you do this weekend? They want to know, like, what'd you do for fun? That's what they wanted to know. Like, did you watch? Did you eat pizza? Well, you know, who'd you hang out with? Did you have to go to work or did you just have fun all weekend? That's what they wanted to know, right? That's what teenagers mean. But they asked that question and man, I just jumped in and started telling them all the things that God did in my life that weekend. And for the first time in my life, I was now, two and a half years later, I was still trying to learn about the Holy Spirit. Two and a half years later, I'm at Bible college, and I've taken a class on the book of Acts. And I learn that the purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is that we are endued with power to be witnesses. And I looked back at my life, and I said, the first time I shared my faith, the first time I ever became a witness was the morning after I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. God did that, and I didn't even know that that's what God was supposed to do. But later, as I kept about the Holy Spirit, I learned that what I experienced was exactly what the Scripture said that I was supposed to experience. Does everybody see that? Man, be ready to learn. And there are some things you're going to experience and then learn about it. There's some things you're going to learn about and then have faith to experience it. Let me say that again. There are some things that you're going to experience and then need to learn about it in the Scripture. There's some things that you're going to learn in the Scriptures and therefore have faith for it. But it comes about when we learn about the Holy Spirit. So be ready to learn about the Holy Spirit. And I believe the next two Sundays you're going to have some great messages on the Holy Spirit where we're going to learn about the Holy Spirit. Here's the third, next thing. Uh, it's not third. I'm probably on four or five. I didn't number my points, so I have no idea how many there are. Here's the next one. Pray out loud. One of the things that I think hinders people from receiving more of the Lord, more from the Lord, is that they've never learned to pray out loud. And I know that for many people who have gone to church uh, throughout the course of their life in a church where, uh, you know, prayer is fold your hands, bow your head, close your eyes, and listen to somebody else talk. When that's our experience, and that's our experience for a long time, a long portion of our lives, it's very difficult for us to break out of that and say, I'm going to become a person who prays out loud. But I challenge you to be a person that prays out loud. Here's why I believe you should be a person that prays out loud. The Bible depicts prayer and praise as something that is verbal. Now, you can think about God, and God hears the prayers of people who pray in their heart. There's one example in the scripture in Samuel chapter 1. Hannah 
was praying that the Lord would give her a child. And the Bible says that Hannah prayed in her heart. Her lips were moving, but no sound was coming out, and she was weeping. Now, this woman was praying in her heart, but she was so emotionally moved that Eli the priest walked over to her, and he said, Hey, lady, you quit your drunkenness. You look nuts over here. She said, I'm not drunk. I'm burdened in my spirit. I have a heavy heart, and I've asked the Lord for a difficult thing. And Eli said, you'll receive it. A year from now, you'll have what you want. And he gave her like a word from God. She prayed in her heart. Now, that's one example of someone praying in their heart. But listen, most of the places in the scripture where someone prays, they pray out loud. And if the people around them can hear them praying out loud. The people who were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, they began to speak. Who did the speaking? They did. They were praying out loud. The Bible says that when Jesus ministered on this earth during his life, he offered up prayers and petition with loud cries to his father, who he knew could save him from death. How did Jesus pray? Jesus prayed out loud. And I'm just going to say this. Jesus probably prayed louder than I do. I mean, I'm not real, sometimes when I pray loud, everybody thinks I'm mad. <laughs> so I'm kind of careful about how loud I get because sometimes when I'm loud, it sounds like I'm mad. Years ago when I was a youth pastor, they were, you need to try preaching to the youth with like more passion and zeal and get loud, shout a little bit. I was like, okay, I will. And man, the next Wednesday night, I was like, I've got to preach this message that I've put together that is specifically made for shouting. I mean, I came up with a shouting sermon, you know, and I preached to those poor teenagers in this little room. And there were like 45, 50 junior hires. Just, they look they looked like somebody that was in a car that was going too fast. <laughs> they, they were scared to death. They're like, why is Pastor, they want to lean over to my wife, Stephanie, and they're like, why is Pastor Paul so angry? <laughs> I'm not, I wasn't trying to be angry. I was actually trying to be filled with joy. I think the, the message was about joy and I'm like going to have this, uh, you know, shouting, happy message that they came out mad. But what I am saying is this, pray out loud. Become a person who learns to pray out loud, worship out loud. The psalmist said, Lord, your praise will continually be in my mouth. He didn't say um, it's continually going to be in my head. It's going to continually be in my mind. It's going to continually be in my thoughts. It is all of those things if it's coming out of your mouth. But he said, I'm not going to just think about God. I'm not just going to muse about God. I'm going to praise God with my mouth. When he talks about prayer, he said, early in the morning, you heard my cry. He spoke it. That word heard that, that he gives us in, in the psalm means that the Lord heard me say it out loud to him. He didn't just hear me think about it, although he knows my thoughts. He heard me pray. And I want to, be, I want to challenge you today to become a person that prays out loud. This week, prepare yourself for next Sunday by spending time in your daily devotions, praying out loud. Maybe you need to go outside on the front porch and shut the door behind you because you need to be alone. And you're afraid somebody's going to hear you praying out loud. And you're like, I don't know. The family hears me praying out loud. They're going to think I'm crazy. Well, then go somewhere where you can get alone and pray out loud. There's a guy at the Washington campus named Louis Day. His dad got saved in the middle of life. And his kids, way down by Boss or Cherryville, Missouri, way out in the country, where Homer Day got saved, they testify to hearing their dad sneak off into the woods to pray because he wanted to be alone when he prayed. He'd sneak off into the woods to pray, but then once he got to praying, they could hear him a half a mile away <laughs> because he got excited in the Lord and he got serious with God and they heard their dad pray out loud. Those kids serve the Lord. And some of those grandkids and great-grandkids of Homer Day serve the Lord. His prayers live on. Amen? Amen? Become a person that prays out loud. Here's the next thing I want to challenge you to do. When you think about praying out loud, you think, well, that's going to that's gonna make me arrogant. No, no, no. Be humble. Be humble. If I want to receive more from the Lord, I need to be humble. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. As we seek for more of the Lord, let's be humble. 
Go to the altar and pray and let other people pray for you and let other people pray with you. Do not be afraid of believers laying hands on you. Be humble enough to say, I need more of the Lord. I need more of the Lord. And that means I'm going to leave my seat and I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say, I'm in need. I have a crisis in my life and I need more of the Lord. And I'm running to him. He has welcomed me to come to his place. He has welcomed me to come into his presence. He has welcomed me. He has, he has called me to come into his presence. And so I'm going into his presence. And I'm humbly saying, I'm in a crisis. I have a need. And I'm willing to humble myself before the Lord and receive what God has for me next. It takes some humility. I'll just tell you another story about myself. And I'll, I'll pick on me. Because if I pick on me, you know I'm not picking on you. How about that? On that Sunday night that I was uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, pastor preached a message on the Holy Spirit. I don't remember anything about the sermon other than I knew that I wanted more of the Holy Spirit. And he invited people to come forward to the altar to pray. And I got out of my seat and I walked all the way to the center aisle. I walked straight down to the middle of the center aisle. And I thought, I'm just going to get right in the middle first thing because there's going to be, that was such a good sermon. So many people are going to be hungry for the Holy Spirit. I got to get up there before all the other people take my spot. And so I got up there fast, and I closed my eyes, and other people in the church would lift their hands when they were seeking God, so I closed my eyes, and I lifted my hands, and I didn't know what to pray, and I didn't know exactly how to pray, but I just closed my eyes and lifted my hands and began to seek the Lord. Well, a few moments later, the pastor gave some more altar call stuff. He told me to open my eyes, and I looked around, and in a room with 300 people, nobody came forward with me. Nobody. Nobody. Well, at that moment, I was a little embarrassed. I realized that I was the only one, and all 300 people were staring at me. The one kid that responded it was at that point that my, my pride just went out the door, and I said, well, God, tonight is for me. This whole service, I just humbly receive it, God. That whole sermon, this whole service, it must be for me because nobody else wants it. But I do. And I'm so thankful that that night the Lord baptized me in the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you what happened in my church? The next Sunday night, my best friend, my younger brother, and my younger brother's best friend all got baptized in the Holy Spirit also. You know what happened? Somebody got something, and everybody else said, I want that too. And they, they said it so, da so drastically that all their pride went away, and they became humble, and they said, I'm going up like Paul went up. I'm going up to receive what my friend received, because if God can do it in him, as like he is, he can do it in me too. <laughs> I'm so thankful for those moments where God teaches us some humility. He teaches us to reach out to him, to set aside our foolish pride and be humble, and to be broken before the Lord all over again. God, I need you again. God, I need you again. God, I need you again. I'm hungry for you. Here's the next thing I want to challenge you to do. Be courageous for God. Acts chapter 2 verse 12 says that when the, the people around the disciples heard about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was being poured upon the disciples, they were speaking in tongues and praising God and worshiping him publicly. They, that they were amazed and perplexed, and they asked one another, what does this mean? The reason they ask, what does this mean, is because the disciples became bold and courageous about their faith. And they became loud, and they became bold in proclaiming the good things of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. Part of being filled with the Spirit, part of learning more about the Holy Spirit, is becoming courageous for God. And I believe that as we put forth a little bit of courage, God shows up with a whole lot of his Holy Spirit to make us more courageous than we were when we were afraid to try in the first place. I believe that it's this thing that builds. If, if I put forth a little bit of courage, then he strengthens me with a whole lot more courage than I had before. Is everybody with me today? You, you, you show God a little bit of courage, and he's going to show up with a whole lot of power that's going to give you more courage than you've ever had before. And it just builds and builds and builds. Be courageous for God. Here's the last thing I want to encourage you with. Jesus said that we're supposed to ask. Ask for more of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes when you ask for more of the Holy Spirit, you have people pray for you, you seek God, you pray, and you think to yourself, well, nothing happened. 
I'm not sure what was supposed to happen right there, but I don't know if anything happened. How many of you ever felt that way before? I've been there. So there's sometimes you're like, I'm not sure what's going on here. I asked, but I didn't receive what so-and-so received and what so-and-so received and what the other people are doing. I, I, I don't see that in my life. I, I don't feel their joy. I don't have their exuberance. I don't have their courage. I don't have their life change. So God, what are you doing? I challenge you to look for God's personal timing. Look for God's personal timing. If there's one thing I can tell you about the work of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit works with each one of us individually. Do not get discouraged. Do not give up when someone else receives something and it looks really neat or it looks really life-changing. It looks really wonderful. It looks really filled with joy. And you're thinking to myself, I didn't get what they got. Listen, don't worry about anybody else. God has timing for you. Listen to what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 2, Jesus had spent 40 days with his disciples after he rose from the dead. And then he ascended into heaven and he left them for 10 days. And for 10 days they prayed and they sought the Lord because in Acts chapter 24, Jesus said to them, remain in the city until you receive power from on high. They didn't know what else to do with themselves as they remained in the city, so they prayed. For 10 days they prayed. And for 10 days, essentially, nothing happened. Nothing happened because it wasn't God's timing. But when the day of Pentecost came, it was time. Because God had a plan. God had to plan to pour out his Holy Spirit on them at a certain time at a certain place so that 3,000 people would be added to the church that day. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 2. It was God's timing. They needed to wait 10 days. He told them they're going to have to wait. They didn't know how long they're going to have to wait. But God had some timing that he was going to work out. I'll tell you in my life, just picking on myself and then I might pick on a few others, but <laughs> in my life, there was some timing. I didn't, I didn't receive all of the Holy Spirit and all the things that he wanted to do in my life all right when I got saved. I didn't receive it all right when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Year after year after year after year, there were other experiences with God, other experiences with his Holy Spirit, experiences with his power, experiences in miracles, miracles of signs and wonders, gifts of the Holy Spirit. A, a message in tongues or an interpretation of tongues, those kinds of things, uh, miracles of healing, miracles of faith, word of knowledge to somebody. Each of those experiences that I've had with the Holy Spirit, they came at certain times, and God did not give me any of those things too early, and he didn't give me any of those things too late. And there are some of those things where before he would give me this next thing, this next experience, or this next understanding of him, he needed to work something out in my life in regard to holiness or purity or desire, willingness to submit to his will and his plan for my life. And I'll tell you right now, in the course of my Christian life, there are times, just like you, where I've argued with God. And I've said, well, God, I don't like that. And God's like, yeah, but that's the way it is. And your life's going to be better if you say yes to me. And so I said yes to God, and then he blessed with a greater understanding of who he is and a greater experience of his presence because I humbled myself and I let him do that work that he wanted to do. And when he did this first work, he's ready to do the next work. And then he did and he's ready to do another work. There's timing to it. There are things he wants to work out in your life. I'll tell you about my timing. Is everybody ready for this? And then we're going to pray. I want to tell you about my timing. Kid, when I was a kid going to that uh, religious school, there was a person that was a good Christian. I realize that now. This person was a good Christian. And uh, this lady came up to me and she said, Paul, someday you'll be a great pastor. And I was like, that sounds like the worst life in the world. Because if you're going to be a pastor, you have to like listen to hymns that sound haunted on a pipe organ all the time. And um, now this is really what I said. That was part of it. But, but this is really what I said. I said, I'm never going to be a pastor because I can't cuss all I want to cuss. I can't drink all I want to drink. And I have to be nice to people. There is no way I'm going to be a pastor because at that point in my life, I wanted to drink all the alcohol I wanted to drink. I wanted to cuss all I wanted to cuss. And I didn't want to be nice to people. I had fun picking on people and bullying people. 
But then I got saved. And in the six months between the time that I got saved and I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the Lord did some work in my life. And the moment that I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, I opened my eyes realizing that I was speaking in other tongues, and I looked at my pastor who was standing in front of me. And the Holy Spirit said, you can do that. And I said, I will. What happened? God's timing. God had some timing because for me, and this isn't true for everybody, God's going to work different ways than different people, but for me, he wasn't just wanting to be, it wasn't just wanting to give me some experience with the Holy Spirit. He wanted to transform the direction of my life and call me to be a pastor. And up to that point, I was saying no for wrong, sinful, ungodly reasons. And he needed to work that out of my life and make me so hungry for him that the next time he tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, would you do that? I was like, oh, yeah. I really want to do that. And I realized in that moment, oh, yeah, all the excuses disappeared. It was God's personal timing. God's got some personal timing for you. I don't know what it is, but I'm telling you, as you experience the Lord, you're going to have a story that's similar to mine, and you'll see how God works in your life. But we've got to ask him. Let's stand to our feet today. Receiving more of God is always a learning process. I'm going to invite the musicians to come to the front. They're going to begin playing a song. And and now it's time to just spend some time in prayer. We've got a few minutes before we have to dismiss today. We're just going to seek the Lord and we're going to pray. We're going to seek the Lord for more. Receiving more of God always includes a learning process. I'm learning about God. It also includes some experience that you're going to have with God. And God has a lot to do in us. Not just baptizing us in the spirit, but like transforming our lives, my desires. God has a lot to do in us, and a lot of it is a purifying, sanctifying work. For some of us, it's a healing work. The Lord wants to do a healing work in you, and he wants to repair and mend and and help you see differently, maybe the most painful parts of your life. I just want to challenge you today to be a person who says, I'm hungry for the Lord. I want more of him. And then I want you to rest and ask and receive. I want you to understand that you can't be good enough to earn more of God, but you can ask. And he wants you to ask. And when we ask, he responds and he begins to work in us. The greatest gift that you'll receive is the gift of Jesus. He died on the cross for your sins to be forgiven for you to be saved. The most important gift that you can receive from God today is salvation in Jesus. How many of you know that's true? How many of you would say, I've received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I'm glad. Hold your hand up and look. I've received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I'm glad. That's, both, that's every person in this room. Now I want you to that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's time for us to just say, God, I'm hungry, and I want more. And maybe you're in the room today and you're like, okay, I want to want more, but I don't even know what I'm supposed to want. That's legit. I want you to spend time and say, I just say that to the Lord. Like, tell him what you're thinking. You can talk to God as honestly as you can talk to your closest friend, the person that loves you unconditionally in your life. You can talk to God like you talk to that person. Maybe that person that you know that you can talk to absolutely with unconditional love and absolute openness is a counselor. Listen, the Holy Spirit of God is your counselor. You can talk to him. And so I want to challenge you today. Let's run to the Lord and say, God, I'm hungry for more of you. And Lord, would you just begin to move and work in my life? Maybe you're in the room today. You say, God, I don't know what it is to be hungry for more of you, what it is to desire more of you. But would you teach me what that is? And let's just ask him to help us. Make me into the kind of person that wants more. And would you just leave your seat right now? Because the Lord is welcoming you into his presence. I'm asking you to move from your seat to find a place to pray at the front. I'm going to move around the room and I'm just going to go pray for people. As the worship team leads us in a song, I'm going to move around the room and I'm going to pray for people. I might not pray for you for a real long time. I may pray something over you that the Holy Spirit gives me and it'll be a word from God. You need to be ready for that. Because that happens sometimes. Sometimes I just pray what I know the scripture says I'm supposed to pray over you. But I want you to receive something from the Lord today. And mostly, I just want you to leave hungry. 
I want every person to walk out of this church and say, pastor preached a great message and I wasn't fully fed because I'm so hungry, he could never feed me. I'm so hungry for more of God that my pastor could never feed me. It's got to be God and God alone. Is everybody with me today? Let's move from where you are. Would you take just a moment and would you pray with me?